and I'll go into my I'll go into it in my sources, but pretty much every one of those um, books, movies, whatever was available through the Merrimack Library, um, Merrimack Valley Library Consortium. So thanks again to all the libraries sponsoring this. And we will take ourselves up the coast from Thatcher Island in Massachusetts to Boone Island in Southern Maine. So I do see um, folks from all over the place Really great to see people from Maryland, from Connecticut. So I, I'm not assuming you know people have a knowledge of the area I'm going to talk about. Um, this is a map of the area I'm not going to talk about because <laughs> usually when you talk about islands in New England, you hit the big three, uh, the big two certainly are Nantucket and, uh, and Martha's Vineyard. And to a lesser degree, there's Block Island. And I've been to all three of these islands. They are fascinating. Um, they have a tremendous amount of history. They are great places to visit. Um, they're much larger than the islands I'm going to talk about. But these uh, three sets I'm talking about are kind of, to a certain extent, lesser known islands off the coast of northern Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and southern Maine. So as an agenda, we're going to take a look, quick look at the economics of colonial America could deal and why we need lighthouses. And then we'll quickly get into the various spots we're going to visit, starting off with Cape Ann and Thatcher Island off of northern Massachusetts, Isle of Shoals off of the 20 mile coast of New Hampshire, and then Boone Island off of southern Maine. So the economics of colonial America. Uh, not surprising, colonial America was a very, particularly New England, was a very, very ocean based economy. And so what you see is the typical Exports are of furs, you have fish, ships, obviously. Um, a lot of shipping is done up along the coast. Some of the major shipbuilding areas are up in Maine and Bath and <clears throat> even in Salem. Salem, I think at the turn of the 1700s was one of the wealthiest towns actually in the, in the colonies uh, in the United States. And you have timber. And so you have a lot of shipping that's going on here. <clears throat> and you see that as you go further south into the, into the uh, colonies, you have a lot of different type of uh, economics here. And you have rice and indigo, you have cattle down in the th southern states. But a lot of the shipping is concentrated up here. It's also going back to England because a lot of the raw materials are going from New England and they're going to England, which is we're talking here at the cusp of the Industrial Revolution in the mid 1700s up until the 1800s. And so that's the raw material. And then those are turned into manufactured goods over in England and in Europe, and those in turn come back to the United States. So you have a lot of to and fro going back and you have a lot of intercoastal stuff going on here. Cause like I said, there's a lot of fishing, a lot of fishing going on off the coast. And we'll see that a lot with Star Island. And so there's a tremendous amount of maritime traffic that's happening in this space. And <clears throat> excuse me, if you've been up to Gloucester, the famous Gloucester fisherman is a statue right around the water, right along the waterfront in Gloucester with its quote from, I believe the Bible, they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. And one of the things that's interesting about this um, statue, you see the picture of the statue, it's on Groton's um, fish, Gorton's fishermen and, and all that. But if you actually go to the statue, there's a semicircle around it, which basically articulates the seamen lost at sea. Um, over the course of like 300 years within Gloucester. And the numbers are just astounding. Uh, some, some years they're in the, in the hundreds, some years they're in the thousands. So it's an incredibly dangerous occupation. I'm sure it's not a surprise to a lot of folks who watch things like Wicked Tuna. It still is today. Um, the uh, perfect storm, all that stuff that happened out of Gloucester. Um, but it is and was a very, very dangerous way of making a living. And as a result, you have these lighthouses which are constructed along the coast to help the navigation. And you end up with a lot of shipwrecks, unfortunately. So this is an eye chart, and I know you cannot see, obviously, read any of these things, but this is just really kind of a shock and off or giving you a, a sense of what we're talking about as far as the numbers of shipwrecks that we're seeing here along the New England coast. And it's, there's so many along Cape Cod that's actually blown out here, and you see all these shipwrecks along Cape Cod. And if you read Thoreau's Cape Cod, his book that was published in 1865 after his death, but it's based on trips he took to Cape Cod in the late 1840s. And in one of the earlier chapters, maybe actually the first chapter, he actually describes a shipwreck on the Cape. And you know, bodies are washing up, debris is washing up. And this is a way actually a lot of the natives are grabbing kind of made, uh, um, raw materials. And when these ships break up, a lot of their cargo washes ashore and it's kind of like, you know, freebies on the beach. And that was a very, very common occurrence to the case that there's 5,400 shipwrecks off the New England coast. 
So once again, um, you know, an incredibly dangerous uh, body of water. A lot of shipwrecks are happening during this. And as a result, we have the need for the lighthouses and a lot of the maritime rescues that go on um, throughout New England. So with that kind of sage steading, we'll jump right into the first place we're going to take a visit to is Cape Ann and Thatcher Island up in Massachusetts. So for those of you who don't know, Cape Ann is here in northern Massachusetts off the coast. You see this kind of detail here. There's Cape Cod hanging out here and Cape Ann kind of hangs out as well. So as a result, it does get whacked by a good amount of storms because as they come up the coast, this is kind of this finger hanging out into the ocean and it is susceptible to a lot of bad weather. And so here is this little island off of about a mile off the, the edge, the eastern edge of Cape Ann is Thatcher Island. And Thatcher Island's kind of blown out right here. This is how you have Strait Smith, um, which I'll get into that a little bit because those two are kind of connected in the fact that they are currently um, serviced by the Thatcher Island Association. And they've done an amazing job in giving you access and building out some of the facilities so you can actually access these two islands in the summer um, off the coast of Rockport, Massachusetts. So the first one is really how Thatcher Island got its name. Um, it's, it's a tough story. Um, basically, Anthony Thatcher um, is a resident of Ipswich, and his cousin is going to be ordained down in Marblehead as a minister for that parish. So he sets out with 21 additional, 22 additional people to go from Ipswich around Cape Ann and down to Marblehead. And of course, this is 1635. So 1635, you know, Massachusetts Bay, Boston was basically established in 1630 with John Winthrop, Pilgrims and Plymouth in 1620. So this is extremely early with the colonialization of New England. And as a result, roads really aren't a thing. So once again, another reason why kind of shipbuilding and ships and um, ocean ferrying is a huge deal in New England is that's how a lot of people transport. So Anthony Thatcher is going on a nice August, late August day from Ipswich down to Marblehead. Unfortunately, he runs into one of the biggest storms ever recorded in New England. Um, so the great colonial hurricane of August of 1635 hits. And like I said, he was accompanying his cousin, John Avery, from Ipswich to Marblehead. Um, the quote from Thatcher is, before daylight, it pleased God to send so mighty a storm as the like was never felt in New England since the English came there, nor in the memories of any of the Indians. So, you know, since the English came there, it's not that long a time. And the Indians, obviously, that is a very long time. So this is a big storm. And obviously, in 1635, they don't have any kind of weather forecasting, except kind of throw your finger up and see which winds are blowing. And so he's heading out around here in Cape Ann, going down to Marblehead, and this monster hurricane is coming through. And so there are folks who actually are able to, um, you know, piece together based on first person accounts. There aren't a lot of obviously, you know, instruments and things along those lines. So it's kind of almost like um, forensic meteorology to piece together the damage um, reports that are written in the first person accounts and what happens. And so they came up with this basically estimation of, you're talking about 130 mile per hour, per hour winds that are cutting through southeastern Massachusetts and the Cape gets really decimated. But he's on the northwestern fringe and that's certainly not a pleasant place to be out in the middle of the Atlantic. So as a result, 21 parish, um, basically everybody except for Thatcher and his wife. Um, he and his wife wash up on shore of Thatcher's Island, obviously not named so at that point, and they're the only survivors. Um, it became, becomes known as Thatcher's Woe and John Winthrop, uh, the governor of Massachusetts Bay, ends up giving it to him, um, kind of as, um, I guess, compensation for the horrible tragedy, but he never actually lives there. Um, he ends up settling down in Yarmouth, Massachusetts, down here in the Cape, and actually he and his wife do have three more children, and in the early 1700s, they sell it back to the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth takes ownership of, uh, ownership of it again in the 1700s, and later in the 1700s, as we'll see, they build lighthouses on it. So Thatcher Island is not that far up the coast. It's less than a mile. Um, you can see it from land very well. This is right off the edge of Rockport. Um, this, I believe, is Long Beach, um, which is along the eastern end of Gloucester and Rockport. Um, so it's, it's very, very visible from land. Um, and it's just amazing when you see how uh, secluded it can be in a storm because the actual sea is it less than a mile going from the mainland over to Thatcher Island. But the big thing that 
um, creates a lot of problems around Thatcher Island is this partially submerged reef called Londoner Reef. And this was a metal marker that was put, and I couldn't find out what the date when this was put in there, but it's been there for a long, long time. But this basically is a marker of where Londoner Reef actually is. And so it's, it's at low tide, it's barely submerged, but this is the part that makes Thatcher Island particularly dangerous because you see the island kind of back here, but out here is this partially submerged reef. And uh, this is what ends up being a problem for a lot of the ships. Like I said, that marker is still here today. And fast forward in a couple of hundred years, um, almost 300 years, you have the next wreck that is kind of related to Thatcher Island. Um, this one is the wreck of the Portland. It's called the Titanic of New England. It happens in late November of 1898. And this uh, passenger boat, uh, the Portland, SS Portland, which goes on a route from Boston to, part, to Portland fairly regularly, um, ends up getting into some trouble. So uh, it's it's a pretty big deal. I mean, this is in, in its day, like I said, even to this point, I mean, the railroads are there, obviously, by the time you get to 1898, but sea travel is still very prevalent. And this journey from Boston to Portland goes nine hours. And like I said, it happens pretty frequently. And uh, it's a $2 round trip. Um, you pay an extra $5 for a stateroom since it's a um, you know, nine hour trip. It can be kind of overnight. And that helps with sleeping accommodations. There's 25 tons of coal are used. So once again, you have the steamship paddle wheel with 25 tons of coal on it. And there's no ship to shore communication on board. And up until this point, it has a perfect safety record. Um, so once again, this is a pretty frequent thing. I mean, I guess you can kind of consider it almost the, you know, the airplanes of, a day, of its day, but unfortunately things don't go so well. So on November 26th and 27th in 1898, you have, which for those of us who have lived in the New England area for a while, remember the perfect storm of 1991, um, this similar thing kind of happens in November of 1898. Um, and these two storm systems merge, creating this incredibly um, big storm. And you have 100 plus mile an hour winds. Some places have 40 inches of snow. Um, from New York up to Maine, you have this storm really covering a, a large part of the East Coast. And Cape Cod actually gets uh, hit the hardest. And uh, in its day, it was considered the worst blizzard since the blizzard of 88, which is only 10 years before. But I will say, when I was growing up in upstate New York in the 60s and 70s, the blizzard of 1880 was still used as the barometer for like the worst storm. So any storm you got, if it was like the blizzard of 88, that was going to be a big one. But um, this one was only 10 years after. And so it ends up being this big storm. And there's a lot of controversy, as there always is with all these wrecks. Um, as to, you know, the, the captain's decisions, you know, the obviously decision to, to um, uh, actually do the trip from Boston to Portland, because at this point, 1898, they obviously have some sort of weather forecasting much more than they had in 1635 with our friend Anthony Thatcher. But still, there's a lot of imperfection, um, a lot of controversy. This captain kind of had a record of like always making his time. You know, you have that kind of stuff going on. Um, there's a perfect safety record. Um, so there was, and once again, there's not a lot of, there's no radio communication. So he, he sets off from Boston and people don't know what happened to him. So unfortunately it sinks. And they don't really know where the boat is. And the last time it's seen is off Thatcher Island. And so Thatcher Island, as you can see, was on its way from Boston to Portland. And so the, the ship does get past Thatcher Island. Typically in storms like this, they will go into a, a harbor, a safe harbor. And uh, so they were, you know, waiting for communication, telegraphed that the boat pull into, you know, whatever Port, Portsmouth or someplace on the way up to Portland, and they can't find any record of it. So all Crews are law, all hands are lost, including the crew and the passengers, about 65 crew and 120 to 130 passengers. And like our friend um, Thoreau, bodies and debris wash up on Cape Cod. And so it looks like, and we'll see in a map in a second here, it looked kind of like the, the nor'easter, which is a you know, wind coming down from the northeast. It's kind of driven the boat almost south. And there was some speculation that it actually may have rammed another schooner on the Addy East Snow. And a lot of things has come out of this. It's, it's, it's a big deal. You know, it's, it's a huge, a huge wreck. Um, obviously, you see the Boston Globe, you know, this is this is big news. And, you know, there's a lot of things that really could have been done better. Certainly, they had no record of who was on the ship, no ship manifest. So one of the things that does come out of this 
crash or this um, sinking is the fact that they now are actually going to keep track of who is on the uh, on the ship because there's all kinds of stories about you know the people who were going to be on the ship and didn't um, and then people who actually were not supposed to be on it and they turned out later on they were so you know for days I think even if not weeks there's all kinds of ambiguity of you know is so and so lost on this um, sinking of the Portland so it's an incredibly tragic story and our friends at the Disney Channel uh, Disney Channel, Discovery Channel, have done a little mock-up of what it might have been like um, for the Portland to actually be overcome by the weather and, and sink. So the Portland ends up at the bottom, come from? ends up at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And um, I see a couple of questions about how much is $2 in 1890 worth today? I don't know that, but um, I think that was a pretty good amount of money to go from one place to the next. And we'll get into the fact um, of why there are two lighthouses. And the other ship, I believe the Addy um, that was rammed actually did survive. That's why they, they think it was hit because they didn't know what hit it. Because once again, you know, this is, you know, there's no radar, there's no sonar, there's nothing, and you're in the middle of this incredible storm, and getting information as to what really happened is tough. This video is interesting because there was a book written about this, actually published relatively recently, just a few years ago, and, you know, we'll find out they did find the wreckage, and so they try to piece together based on the wreckage kind of what happened, and what they surmised was, and I'm a land lover, so I'm not, a, I'm not a big sailor, but, you know, they their bow should be pointed toward the waves. And at some point it got um, parallel to the waves and got swamped, which is what this video shows. And once again, you have 25 tons of coal, um, which, you know, if that doesn't get distributed correctly, you're gonna have some big problems. And I believe that it was a, a steamer, a paddle boat, which I think after this crash or the sinking, there weren't that many they would ever put in sea again. All the paddle boats you see now are mostly in the river, and of course you associate it with the Mississippi River. But a paddle boat on the was not really an ocean-going thing. This one was shore. You know, it's, it, it kind of kept pretty close to shore, going from Boston to Portland. But um, not the best um, outfit for a ship. And so, with the sinking happens, those things kind of go the way of the dinosaur. So as I mentioned, you know, the the shipwreck the the debris and everything ends up washing up on Cape Cod. So you see the boat, uh, ship leaves from Boston going up to Portland and everything starts washing up here. And so they kind of surmise that it may have actually, because you see it's Thatcher Island's up here and this is the last time it's seen. So it potentially is kind of up here getting driven by the Northeast winds. And so it kind of ends up, which is this place called the Stellwagen Bank, which is actually a national marine sanctuary. And the 1980s um, is actually discovered on the floor there. And uh, I guess because of possible scavenging and other things, um, the actual location really isn't publicly known, but there was a separate confirmation in 2002 that validates it is the Portland. And uh, this little clip actually shows a little bit of what some of the, um, video taken down at the actual wreck scene on the floor of the ocean looks like. The SS Portland, steamship passenger vessel that sank with all hands and crew aboard. 
Portland has been called New England's Titanic. current technology, we can bring the public there. This is exactly what we're going to do in September during the live dive and the live broadcast that we have planned with our partners at Witch Hole Oceanographic and Marine Imaging Technology. I'll tell you all the honest and God truth, I haven't seen that from the outside that we're looking at. Yep. The water's cold, dark, currents are strong. So it's, it's not a trivial uh, undertaking to immerse the public in the site itself, real time. It's been 10 years since anyone's looked at the Portland. We're here to continue that story. I mean, sorry about that. Woods Hole is a, a gem of New England. Um, it's the Oceanographic Institute down in uh, southern Cape Cod, and uh, they are at the cutting edge of technology of all kinds of different things that are used for sea exploration. I believe they were hooked up with Ballard, who did the Titanic. And actually, uh, a gentleman I grew up with, Mike Purcell, if anybody knows Mike Purcell from Guildland, New York, he went on to work at Woods Hole and uh, actually had a lot to do with a lot of these submersibles that are used. So it's a phenomenal institute down there in Cape Cod, if you ever get a chance to go down there, and then they do have, this, they do allow visitors there. And the last part of Thatcher Island I'll get into is the mayhem part, and this is a crazy story. Um, there is a mafia hitman named Joe the Animal Barboza, and so he is actually, this thing going to work here, um, he's a mafia hitman, he's actually Portuguese, so he believes, and I think it's accurate, he can only rise so far on the, in the Italian controlled New England mafia. So he ends up flipping and becomes government witness against the New England mafia. I think Raymond Patriarca was the, uh, the head of that family. And so he's going to testify and to keep him safe uh, while they're waiting to testify in the trial, the FBI decides to keep him on Thatcher Island. So in October of 1967, he's actually sequestered on Thatcher Island with his family. And I said, the story's crazy. We'll get into the book a little bit. But the mafia actually tries to send out a boat to take him out. And as a story of this boat goes kind of alongside Thatcher Island, and they're going to assassinate um, Joe the Animal Barboza. But there's like 15 FBI agents, and they all come walking out with their submachine guns, and the boat decides to turn around. So it's really, really a bizarre story. Um, and then it gets even more bizarre because he becomes kind of the first, if one of the first, if not the first, um, who goes into the FBI witness protection program. Unfortunately, it doesn't really end up that well. He's murdered in San Francisco as a member of that program which hopefully they've improved that since then. But he was defended by the famous defense lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, who had a very famous quote about him and he died. He goes, with all due respect to my former client, I don't think society has suffered a great loss. So Joe the Animal Barboza is kind of a cartoon character in a very nasty way. And there was actually a book written about him in 2013. And it was actually optioned for a movie in 2018. I can't find out if it's actually going to be made or not, but the movie was going to be called Thatcher Island. And there's a book, Casey Sherman, he writes a lot of true crime, true crime, true crime books um, based in New England. He wrote one, The Boston Strangler, wrote one, I think, on the serial killer in Cape Cod, which is being meant, uh, being made into a series on either Netflix or somebody called it, I think, Hellbent. Um, but he wrote this book, Animal at the Bloody Rise and Fall of the Moth, the Most Feared Assassin. And uh, this Joe the Animal Barboza is just an awful, awful person. But um, they kept him safe on Thatcher Island for a month while he testified, and he did put a lot of the Mafia dons and the New England mob uh, in jail in the late 1960s. But let's go to modern day Thatcher Island, and it's about 50 acres, and it's controlled partly by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the southern end is by uh, the town of Rockport. And like I said, it's about a mile off the coast. 
Um, it's managed by the Thatcher Island Association, which is based out of Rockport. And that's how you get out there. You can kayak yourself and pay a landing fee, but if you want to go out on a boat, um, they have launches, which are very small. There's only about six people per launch. And I found out the most cost-effective way to get out there is to become a member, which is $30 a year, and they get you two seats. Um, you can take a person with you, like I do with my wife sometimes, um, or you can go on two separate trips. And if you do separately, they're $35. Um, the challenge is there's only six seats on it, so you have to book your seats way in advance. They, before they started taking reservations on the internet, they used to open up the phones like in mid-May, and you had to call them in mid-May for this poor person who had to answer the phone and get your seat, which would be pretty much they start late June and go all the way through um, Labor Day. And uh, so you have to kind of, you get, you get your date. I say they go on Wednesdays and Saturdays out to Thatcher, and they go on Tuesdays out to Tradesmith. And you just pick your day and hope the weather's good. And um, I've been going out there about six years now. And fortunately, the weather's been pretty good. And Strait Smith is the second one that they manage out there. And this is looking at Strait Smith from across by Thatcher Island. This is a closer view of Strait Smith. There's a small lighthouse on Strait Smith. And they just opened that up to the public um, about two years ago. Amazing, amazing group of people, all volunteer for the most part, um, except for this guy, Sebastian. Um, he was our first mate as we took our little launch going to Thatcher Island. And there is not a dock per se, there is a ramp. And so you come on these crafts or basically landing crafts where you open up in the front and disembark and enter in the front. And so they have this little ball with a, with a line on it. They throw it out to a guy who attaches it to a winch and the winch pulls you up this thing for a few yards and then you disembark here and you walk onto the island. And the first thing you see is all the lobster boys that have walked, washed up on the island. As you can imagine with the weather and stuff, there's a lot of lobster traps that get trashed on the island, but this is the little hut that's right there as you get off. And then you also have another thing which we'll get into here is seagulls. And uh, I'll have a video here that kind of explains the whole seagull thing here. This guy is gonna go Hitchcock on you. Um, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of seagulls on there. And the only tip I will have is I typically go later in the season because early in the season is the height of nesting season and the seagulls are very aggressive about protecting their young. Um, so it can get a little, you got, got to pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, later on in the season, they kind of calm down, but there are a lot of them and there's actually an explanation for this. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has put together a quick little video, which I think is pretty interesting kind of explaining how the seagulls have ended up uh, kind of taking over Thatcher Island. <laughs> On a journey, six biological staff went to conquer the infested rocks. Conquer the infested rocks. Thatcher Island was the name of the place. They found the population. Wait a minute. Stop the frame. Where are all the terms? The common, Arctic, the Rosian. They used to live here about 50 years ago. All I see now are the big herring and black back gulls. Do you see them? They've overpopulated the island. It's a story something like the Lorax. The terns lived on this island. They called it home. They foraged for their brood and watched their young grow. At the turn of the 19th century, big feathered hats were all the rage. It was the millinery trade. They were selected for their elegant plumage and the populations began to fade. While the populations were weak, another pressure came on to the screen. In the 70s, a new regulation, unlike what others had seen, required open landfills to be sealed, which was previously gull feed. The gulls' inflated numbers fled the trash heaps. They found Thatcher Island, and they made the terns leave. Their population expanded, reaching thousands upon more blackbacks inland and herring gulls down by the shore. But don't you fret, the story has not ended yet. What? There's more to come? Indeed, with bravery and dedication, biologists scamper the rocks. It is a mere poke in the yoke that brings the growing gull to a stop. The goal here is to restore the turns. 
we have high hopes and we have much to learn. The turn populations may return to their native place. The journey will be long, but our stewardship is vital and may be their saving grace. So it's kind of a, a great example of the law and un, unintended consequences um, as these series of things happens. And I will say the gulls, I mean, you can't really overestimate how many gulls there are there. Like I said, there's volunteers out there and some of them do overnight in the keeper's house. And we were talking to one last summer and he said at night, it's just unbelievable how loud it is. And last summer was rough because as you remember, last summer was kind of dry. <clears throat> so as a result, there wasn't any, any rain and all the gull guano was everywhere. So it was a little bit of a challenging time out in Thatcher Island, but um, the gulls really do totally rule the roost there. So they're known as Anne's Eyes. Uh, the first, light, first lighthouse was uh, built there in 1771, and I believe that was actually two were built there in 1771, and then the current towers are built in 1861, and they're 124 feet tall, I think about 160 to 180 steps. Um, they are in a northwest, excuse me, north-south axis, so when the lights line up and you only see one light, you know you're looking north-south. And so I guess there's a few lighthouses that are done this way, and it's a way of you know, another different way of being um, uh, different to allow navigational, you know, they have different lights, they have different colored lights, they have different frequency of the, of the uh, beam, the flash and all that stuff. <clears throat> so with this one, they decided to do two. Um, I know there was the three sisters were down on Cape Cod. Um, they've been moved a little bit inland on the Cape and you can see them down there near Brewster, I think. But um, obviously for the most part, there were single lighthouses, but this one, um, and it, this one is, is really designed for the London Reef, where I think most lighthouses up until this point were really markers for a port. So you have Portland Headlight, you have Boston Light, which is the first one that was ever done, ever commissioned uh, in the United States. Those are kind of the reasons for the lighthouses. And then you start getting these lighthouses built, which really are warnings against um, dangerous areas. And the London Reef is a dangerous area by Thatcher. And like I said, you can walk up the, the South Tower this is um, from a portal uh, looking out of the South Tower going toward the North Tower. Uh, it's, it's 160 to 180 steps. And like I said, you have to book your um, launch way in advance. And I was there a few years ago on the hottest day of the year. And I will say the 100 and some odd step thing was uh, the woman at the top. They have a docent who's actually at the top of the South Lighthouse who can tell you what was going on. Um, I think she was a bit shocked when I got up there because it was <laughs> very sweaty. And um, it's a beautiful place for photography. They have a heliport here. Um, this is actually taken from the South Tower. You can see the reflection of the window looking north toward the North Tower. This is an infrared photograph and you can see all the foliage. And this is kind of the oil house, which they situated between both the lighthouses um, for ease of transporting between. And also if anything happens to happen with this thing, it you know, goes on fire, blows up, at least your farthest away as you possibly can be on this island uh, from the two lighthouses. And it did have a first order Fresnel, Fresnel lens for all of you aficionados of lighthouses. That's the strongest Fresnel lens that was made. Um, it is actually a display at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester, which is relatively recent. It used to be down at the US Coast Guard Museum down in uh, New London, Connecticut. And it was moved there to Cape Ann, I think the last 10 years. And this picture doesn't really do as justice. I should have had somebody stand next to it. This thing is giant, it's this 12 feet tall and it's three tons. Uh, so these lights, I mean, they use all this, you know, Fresnel developed all these lenses and everything to take a very, very small piece of light and being able to, some of these things, I think the first order lens may go like 20 miles. Um, so this has all been replaced by um, LED technology today and it's automated, but that was what they used back in the 1800s, early 1900s. And it's a pretty place. I mean, there's, you know, lots of vegetation, lots of walkways around, and there's a, a path all the way around the island. And obviously you have your two lighthouses as a focal point. Um, it's a pretty place, but it's, you know, it's an island and islands, as we'll find out, uh, you know, they're, they are tough places and they're unforgiving places. And certainly Thatcher Island is that. And so I've been going there for about six or seven years and I've experienced everything there from incredible wetness to incredible heat, to incredible dry, to incredible amount of gulls, uh, interesting place. And they had this railroad track system. You saw the picture before you had the oil house in the middle of the island. And so they had a lot of stuff there moving around. And so they have to move these you know, large quantities of, of stuff. I'm sure there was some coal involved and there's oil involved and they gotta go between two towers. So they built this railroad system with this turntable there, um, which is pretty neat and it's, uh, you can still see that. 
And so we can walk down the launch, uh, walk down the ramp, actually hop in the launch, and we can bid adieu to our friends at Thatcher Island and head about 40 miles north. And so a couple of questions, I'll take some questions on Thatcher. I see a couple of questions about how long can you stay. Um, the, the trips are about three and a half hours. So you leave, um, anyway, they, they leave every hour, every hour, every half hour, you know, like eight in the morning. So you get an eight o'clock launch and you have to get back on the 1130 launch. We have an assigned launch when you when you come back. So you have to they have their seats of six people. So the six, same six people that go off in the eight o'clock launch are the same ones that come back on the 1130. Um, and staying overnight, like I said, they do have volunteers and um, people do um, become lighthouse keepers for, I forget what the, what the tenure is, but that's something you have to be a member of and be involved in the volunteer and stuff like that. I said, lighthouse keepers, it's amazing the amount of work these people do out there. They've done an incredible amount of carpentry, serious cement work and building the, um, the ramps, both on Strait Smith and on Thatcher Island. Every time I go out there, you know, these people are not Sunday carpenters. I mean, they're people who knew what they would know what they were doing. And, you know, they had other lives, but they definitely were, you know, serious, at least serious hobbies, if not actual professionals. And even some of the people who run the launches, one of the guys who's a captain of the launches, he's a, a retired Navy uh, submarine captain. So um, some pretty serious talent out there to keep Thatcher Island going. And, you know, as I, what I suggest visiting, I think it's a fascinating place. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not like you just walk up to it and you can like a lot of lighthouses on the coast. You can kind of drive up Portland Headlight. You can drive up there, get out, walk around, get back in your car and go home. Uh, all these places are not that. Um, they do require a little bit of effort to do it. So like I said, we'll head 40 miles north up into New Hampshire slash Maine and the Isles of Shoals. And so a little orientation here. These are the Isles of Shoals off the coast of New Hampshire. This is Portsmouth here, Maine, Kittery, Kittery Point right here. Can see this a little bit more you know the only 20 miles of coastline here in new hampshire between massachusetts and maine and the actual state line for maine and new hampshire goes through the isles of shoals this becomes a little bit of an issue when we talk about the murders on smutty nose but appledore and smutty nose are in the state of maine and the other islands star and white being the most prominent are in the state of new hampshire and this is kind of a cool little visual is this is basically the Isles of Shoals, and you can see how far on the land, because this is the coastline as you're going from Cape Ann all the way around to Cape Nettick in Maine, and what you can see from the Isles of Shoals, you can see you kind of kind of can't see Thatcher because it's tucked a little bit behind here, Strait Smith is kind of over here, and then here on the east you can see Cape Nettick, which is where the Noble Light is, and Boone Island's kind of out over here. Um, so when I was a kid, I summered on Long Sands Beach up here, in York Har and uh, well near York Harbor in York Beach, and I can barely see Appledore and White Island. So at night you could see the the lighthouse from White Island. Obviously you could not see Thatcher, and looking over this way, kind of almost straight out, you can see Boone Island. So so we'll start with um, Star and White Island, and Star Island and White Island. This is the hotel, and this is the the original hotel um, on. Star Island was built in 1873, but it burns two years later. If you're familiar with a lot of the resort hotels in the New England Adirondack area, uh, most of those do end up burning, um, but they build a new one right after it. The kind of funny thing is this one was a very high-end luxury hotel. Um, it was basically some financier from uh, Boston actually ends up kind of financing this stuff and owns it. So when he builds the second version, he kind of cheaps out and it's not nearly as luxurious. And ironically enough, this is the same one. So most, you know, the stuff has been, you know, certainly you know, uh, updated and, you know, boards have been replaced or whatever, but this basically is the structure from 1875. So the fact it's still there is astounding and we'll get into that in a little bit, um, but it is kind of ironic that it, it's not a luxury place. This is some pretty rustic living when you stay out here. Um, it ends up being bought in 1916 by Oscar Layton, who was Celia, Celia Thaxter's brother, and we'll get into Celia's story in a second. And they formed the Star Island Corporation and buy the island for $16,000 in 1916. And eventually, and this is how I knew it as a kid, conferences um, begin being held out there by the Unitarians and the Congregationalist churches. And so to my understanding, up until relatively recently, it was pretty much exclusive to the, the religious conferences in the summer. Um, but they've opened it up to secular conferences, and I stayed out there 
in 2006 as part of a photography group I'm a member of the New Hampshire Society of Photographic Artists. They used to run a yearly photography trip in September out to Star Island. They've since ceased that, but um, I spent uh, four days and three nights out in Star Island uh, about 16 years ago, and uh, it was absolutely fascinating. And the White Island Lighthouse, which is where Celia Thaxter grew up, right off the western edge, I believe, of Star, that was built in 1821. And Celia's father was Thomas Layton, who was the light keeper of White Island. Um, and the interesting thing about these light keepers is a lot of it, they were political appointees, which I don't think people really understand that. And so he actually ran for governor of New Hampshire, loses, but he gets appointed the light keeper. And uh, then as we'll see, when we get into Appledore Island, he ends up becoming quite the entrepreneur and really um, starts a lot of the stuff that happens in now the shows in the 1800s. But the story I was familiar with, um, I went to the Isles of Shoals as a very, very young boy, probably 10 years old, um, a day trip. You can take boats out of uh, Portsmouth. I think they still run boats out of Rye, New Hampshire as well. And I wasn't familiar with the Smutty Nose Murders, which we'll get into, but I was familiar with this. As a 10-year-old, this kind of fascinated me. This is a story of the school teacher, Miss Underhill, who in 1848 gets washed out to sea by a rogue wave. And so I guess she's just kind of hanging out in the rocks here, Star Island, probably the part that faces out to the open ocean, and she gets washed away. And I don't believe they ever found her. And so as a result, this rock out on Star Island gets known as Miss Underhill's chair. And so this just absolutely was, I think, probably slash terrified me slash fascinated me when I went out there um, for a day trip uh, back about 50 years ago. But the Island and Star Island was kind of interesting because it's forced to evacuate during the Revolutionary War. Because as you can imagine, it's out at sea, really can't be protected. So in the 1770s, uh, mid 1770s, when the war starts, they make everybody pretty much get off the island. And then after the war, a fishing village called Gosport ends up being established in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And this is the Gosport Chapel, which is built, I think, in 1800s, a stone chapel. Um, still there today. When you're out in Star Island, pretty much every night they have a, a candlelight service, which is kind of a rite of passage uh, as you're a, a resident, a resident. As visitor out in Star Island and uh, for photography. I mean, I was lucky that those four days, three nights we were out there was just phenomenal because we had thunderstorms, we had fog, we had beautiful sunsets, we had nice light, decent clouds. It was an amazing uh, kind of cornucopia of photographic possibilities there for, for th um, four days and three nights. And these places aren't big, so there's no you know long drive to see the sunrise. You just basically fall out of bed in the hotel, go out the front steps and you know, Mother Nature's right there for you. So it was a pretty amazing place as far as photography goes. Um, a lot of great subjects. And you've got, like I said, it's hasn't changed a lot probably from the 1870s. You know, you get your meals family style. This is a dining room, kind of reminds me a little bit of a of the movie Shining to a certain degree, but um, got that kind of old vibe, um, but it really is, is a throwback. And like I said, with most of these islands, unfortunately you're not really that far from your maker. And so there's this small cemetery, which is right smack um, next to the Oceanic Hotel. And it's kind of hard to go too far around here without running into this um, cemetery. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be a great idea to use that as kind of a focal point? So I was doing some juxtaposition of the cemetery with here White Island and here the uh, tombstone with White Island and this one with the Oceanic Hotel. But it's, uh, you know, it, these are tough places to live. There's no doubt about that. And White Island is right off, like I said, the western edge. There's a cairn here, which is built on Star Island. You can see the White Island Lighthouse in the background. This is kind of a close up with it. And once again, there's not much on this island. And Celia Thaxter, the famous poet, you know, she grows up with, I think, uh, five siblings, I believe, with Thomas Layton as an uh, innkeeper here in the 1830s. Um, so it really is a pretty, pretty small spit of land. And um, I know there's a, the head of, at least the former head of the uh, Lighthouse Historical Society, Jeremy Detrimont. He's done presentations for libraries. He goes into a lot of the stories with the families on these islands. And you can imagine, you know, it, 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 at 50,000 feet, it sounds kind of glamorous. Then you start giving any kind of thought to it. It's like, these are rough places to live. And when we get to Boone Island, um, we'll show a little bit more how challenging that was. But um, it's a pretty place. This is really looking over the Gosport Harbor, which you have Smutty Nose Island here, which we'll get to, and Appledore, which we'll get here. 
Um, this is just a very nice, um, you know, chairs on a deck, but you do have your little cemetery kind of out there. And this is interesting. It says, please put out your cigarettes. When you go to Star Island, literally within the first half hour of you there, you get what is called the fire talk. Because you're out like seven or eight miles out at sea, there is no fire department. They give you this whole spiel about, you know, fire is a big deal. And so the, the fact this thing is, has survived since 1875 without burning down is phenomenal. And so basically, if you light up a cigarette, you're in the next boat out, no questions. So it's kind of ironic at some point, you know, they told you before you went to stairs to put out your cigarette. So how it survived from 1875 is, is pretty amazing to me, but they make it very, very apparent when you're on that island, as soon as you get there, that is very serious business. And ironically enough, one of the guys who I became friends with out on the island, um, like I said, is rustic. And so we ran to um, this room that had outlets and we were charging our, our devices and our camera batteries. So we became friendly and turns out that he was a fireman out in Rye, New Hampshire. And subsequently becomes the fire chief in Rye, New Hampshire. His name was Paul Haas. And he was saying, yeah, it's like, you know, if there's a fire out there, it's going to be a long time before any fire will get you. So you're on your own. And um, they make that very, very clear when you're on the island. And like I said, you know, the island gets populated in the um, early 1800s with this village of Gosport. And they do more than fishing. They actually have animals. This is a turnstile, which will let people through and sheep will not be through. Um, ironically enough, what kind of ends this um, settlement here at Gosport is the um, building of the Oceanic Hotel. This um, businessman from Boston basically buys out these people and kind of ships them off the island and ends making it a tourist mecca. Um, this is the largest um, uh, cemetery funeral marker in the state of New Hampshire for a Reverend Tuck from the 1630s or the 1700s. Um, unfortunately, he was a slave owner, um, but fortunately for him, one of his descendants uh, is the Tuck who the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth is named for. So in the early 1900s, he financed a marker um, for this guy's grave. And this thing really sticks out on, the, on Star Island. Like I said, it was beautiful vistas. We got all kinds of atmospheric stuff going on. So as far as a photographer goes, it was an amazing four days to be out there. And you know, Mother Nature gave us the whole gamut of what uh, she has to offer in, in early September in the coast of New England. So moving over from Star Island to Appledore, this is a city of Baxter's home base uh, for many years. And like I said, her father, Thomas, Thomas Layton, he was a light keeper, but also an entrepreneur. And he gets the idea in the late 1840s to build a hotel out here. And, you know, once again, this is pretty revolutionary because, you know, the tourist industry, as we know it, doesn't really start till after the Civil War. I think you could argue that probably Niagara Falls is one of the earliest, what we consider a tourist destination. I think that really got kind of developed in the 1870s. But he's doing this in the 1840s. And so he's got quite a suite of stuff here. And he's got the, all these hotels in Appledore Island. So Appledore Island becomes quite the destination for um, well-to-do summer visitors um, in New England. And even international. If you're familiar with the um, Treaty of Portsmouth, which ended the Russo-Japanese War that was negotiated by Theodore Roosevelt, and I believe he won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. That was actually signed at the Wentworth by the Sea Hotel in Newcastle, right outside Portsmouth. And in 1905, when they had the um, negotiations, the delegates from both Russia and um, Japan went to Appledore and uh, met here. I'm not sure if they considered it, they actually did some of the deliberate excuse me, deliberations here, they might have, but um, it was quite a place. Unfortunately, like most of these things in 1914, it burns. And obviously this is right before World War I. And so it does not get rebuilt and Appledore kind of goes into disarray for years, but it does have its heyday with Celia Layton Thaxter. And she was quite a popular, uh, very widely read poet and prose writer in the late 1800s in America. And she's a daughter of Thomas Layton. Um, her husband is Levi Thaxter, who is a big mucky muck in Boston and introduces her to a lot of cultural luminaries. And it becomes kind of a salon out at Appledore. And you have, you know, the really the, the who's who of mid to late 1800s in New England and intelligentsia are certainly cultural literary icons like Nathaniel Hawthorne, John Greenleaf Whittier, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the actor Edwin Thomas Booth, uh, John Wilkes Booth, his brother, and the impressionist painter Child Hossam. And she was famous for her garden. And so they still have part of her garden there. And this was a little piece that was done by um, Chronicle. If you're familiar with Channel 5 up here in the Boston area, we have a gem that 
pretty much every night at 730, they have a, a news magazine that really celebrates a lot of what goes on in New England. And this is a uh, one from a few years ago that kind of are, um, talks about what goes on in Appledore Island. They float on the horizon just within sight of land. Nine islands, eight miles off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine. The Isles of Shoals. Access to these tiny granite buttons is limited. But one of these remote rocks, the island of Appledore, is the unlikely location of a famous garden. One that's cultivated quite a following. We have day tours that come and view the garden and people come out for about four hours and they have a walking tour and they get to enjoy time in the garden and they have lunch in our dining hall. That's true of a lot of invasive species out here. They're Jennifer Seavey, here, executive sure, director of the Shoals Marine Laboratory, a field station on Appledore run jointly by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell University. And because they're isolated on the island, they haven't mixed with the other introduced apple trees on the mainland. Summer students here earn a semester's credit in just two weeks. They're really intensive classes, but they're fun because the students are not in a lecture hall all day, they're out here. But as the great Joni Mitchell once said, it's time to get ourselves back to the garden and the lasting legacy of one Celia Thaxter. Celia grew up on a neighboring island, White Island, in a lighthouse. Her dad was a lighthouse keeper. And they had a very small patch of land there. So everything green was really precious to her, so she fell in love with plants. In fact, Celia Thaxter published a book about coaxing such voluptuous blooms out of this bony soil. Today, the garden is in the exact location with the exact flowers as described in the Island Garden book. Thaxter planted her garden while working at the Appledore House, a large Victorian era hotel that has since burned down. A published poet, Thaxter hosted many well known writers and artists Emerson, Hawthorne, and most especially the painter Child Hassam. The garden is featured in most. A lot of his work, a lot of his early work especially. Hassam fell in love with Appledore, returning time and again to capture its color, texture, and cast of light. It continues to work its charms on artists today. Appledore in particular has been a destination for artists for over 100 years. And I think that's, you know, the same reasons art, artists come out here now as the reasons they came out there then, which is that it's, it's a very elemental place. Chris Volpe is artist in residence at the Shoals Marine Lab. As such, he spends time with the students here, lending his aesthetic sensibilities to their scientific pursuits. The trade-off? Volpe gets a lot of alone time. It's amazing to, to be standing on a rock in the middle of an ocean with no one else in sight for hours on end. Absent civilization, uh, you get a little closer to the elemental forces, I think, that, that drive the planet and that drive us. There are indeed elemental forces at work on Appledore. Just try not to be too alarmed at the roving bands of youth armed with sticks. No, this isn't Lord of the Flies. Students carry sticks to ward off gulls protecting their newborn chicks. And tours of Cecilia Thaxer's garden so it always comes back to the gulls. Um, they do have sticks available when you get off the uh, launch at Thatcher Island for you to uh, hold above your head, which kind of, I guess, messes with the death perception of the gull on there. They want to dive at your head, but they'll dive at whatever is kind of held up and they'll dive at the stick rather than your head. And so when I was there, they had plowed under the garden. So it was in early September. Um, but there were still a few sunflowers to take pictures of. And this is the Marine Shoals Lab, which is a um, joint venture between UNH and Cornell. Um, and it is a fascinating place. And Celia Thaxter is a, a fascinating person. Um, they have an exhibit of hers in a little museum in Kittery called the Kittery Historical and Naval Museum, I be, believe, which is just south of the outlets on Route 1 in Kittery. And they have examples of um, some of her work. Um, she actually hand illustrated some of her books of poetry. And then, like they mentioned, the uh, 
the uh, impressionist, American impressionist painter, Child Hassan, we'll get to in a second. Um, she basically, he illustrated a book of hers, uh, A Christmas Story. So it's a neat little museum to get there. But Child Hassan, he says, as far as I know, he's the, pretty much the most famous American impressionist. Uh, lived from 1857 to 1935. He spent many summers for decades in Appledore, and they claim about 10% of his lifetime output was on Appledore. And if you're into the New England art colonies, happen in this time frame, inevitably, Child Hossum appears at them. He's down in Summon, Connecticut. He's up here in Maine, uh, Maine, New Hampshire. Um, he's all over the place, but he's a fascinating guy and makes beautiful work. And when I was on Apple Door, we did have a little launch that took us over for an afternoon in Apple Door. And I, I really wasn't familiar with this um, painting he did until relatively recently when I was putting this together and I came up with a picture I had taken. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was, I was kind of unknowingly totally mimicking Child Hassan, but um, it's a beautiful spot. So we'll go from kind of uh, that bucolic theme to the most infamous story I'm gonna talk about, um, Smutty Nose Murders which happened on Smiley Nose Island in 1873. And Nathaniel Hawthorne has a quote that I've never seen a more dismal place. And I believe that quote was done before the murders actually happened in 1873. But you can see that Appledore is over here and Smutty Nose is over here. And we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, that has some importance in the story. Uh, these are the two buildings that are still surviving on Smutty Nose. Neither of them is the house where the murders occurred. Um, the murders occurred kind of here. Uh, in the evening of March 5th and 6th, 1873, two women are murdered and one survives. Um, there was a Norwegian fishing, I wouldn't say it's a village, but there were Norwegian fishermen here. They were immigrants from Norway um, and they lived here and they were relatively, relatively successful. And this is one of the times when the men were in town, they kind of got stuck in Portsmouth and they were having to bait their traps. And uh, a, a guy who had worked on the island and was familiar with them um, found out that they were alone on the island and he realized or knew that they were relatively successful fishermen and believed there was like $600 out there. So he got the idea that he could row out, steal it and come back and nobody be none the wiser. His name is Louis Wagner. He was a Prussian immigrant and he does row from Portsmouth. It was a full moon that night and he, uh, it was a, the tide was going out. So he um, leaves the Piscataway River. If you're familiar with the Piscataway River, it's it's one of the strongest currents, if not the strongest current of a river in the United States. And so he's able to get out to Smutty Nose. Unfortunately, um, there's a, unbeknownst to him, one of the, the women is sleeping in the um, kitchen. And so he wakes her up and she recognizes him. First, he, he thinks it's her brother. And then she says his name. And the woman who escapes, um, which is uh, Marin, she does not see him, but she hears the other woman say his name. And like I said, he had worked out there, I think about six months to a year before. And so she saw this kind of dark figure and she escapes. And um, he tries to track her down. We'll get to a little map of what, what happened with that. Um, one of the women who was killed actually had worked at the hotel on Appledore. And so she was a maid for Celia Thaxter's hotel. And Celia Thaxter is, she's right there when it, she doesn't see it happen, but she's right next to it. And obviously all the stuff hits the fan the next morning when the men come back and find the murdered women, the uh, woman who escaped comes up and they basically understand that this guy, Louis Wagner is the one who had done it. And so Celia Thaxter writes what is kind of considered the first true crime nonfiction in American literature um, called A Memorable Murder. And it's published in the Atlantic Monthly um, in 1875, right before Louis Wagner is hanged for the murder. And people consider it her finest prose work. And I've read it and it's actually pretty good. Uh, I think it's about 30 pages or something. So this is the infamous of the infamous as far as crimes of the century um, until Lizzie Borden, which happens about 15 years later in 1892. But Louis Wagner is arrested and you know he pleads innocent. I guess he's quite a charismatic guy. Um, unfortunately, I think you can use the term sociopath. But you know, he has people who are kind of on his side and uh, there is, you know, they don't have a really good explanation of who else would have done it because there's these, it's in the snow, it's in March. So there's still snow on the island and there's footprints of, of 11, size 11 shoe in the snow. And of course there's three women there and none of them have a size 11 shoe, but Marin runs from the house, goes all the way back to the edge of the island with her dog, who she's trying to keep quiet and hides here all night long in the early March until he actually docked his 
um, rowboat here. <laughs> he, of course, searches for her, can't find, doesn't find her, leaves, rows back to Portsmouth, dumps the boat. People see him actually coming, looking very disheveled. And so it becomes this huge, you know, you have multiple newspapers going on. One of the newspapers in Portland is, excuse me, in Portsmouth, is kind of saying he did it. Other ones are casting questions on it. He himself even starts, you know, insinuating that maybe the woman who escaped did it. Um, but there's really no motive for that and really no evidence. I mean, obviously you're talking about circumstantial evidence. You know, there's no fingerprinting even at this point, obviously no DNA, but he does go to trial. And one of the big things was his defense lawyer was trying to actually get it put into a diff different jurisdiction because there was this whole thing about was it in Maine or was it New Hampshire? And he, he tries to waylay a lot of things to, you know, bringing up old deeds from the 1600s, trying to show it as a different jurisdiction. Not sure exactly how that would help his client's case, but just trying to throw a smoke screen. But basically, um, all that comes, he's convicted by a jury and he's hanged for the crime in Maine, in Alfred, Maine, in 1875. Um, capital punishment is abolished right afterwards. There's another kind of legend about this that Louis, Louis Wagner was the last person hanged in Maine. That's actually not true. Um, they abolish it, but then they re reinstitute it and then abolish it again. But um, he kind of plants a seed and the seed becomes a little bit more prevalent in the fact that um, Marin did it. And so there's this thing that happens like in the 18, late 1870s, this conspiracy theory that Marin gives a deathbed confession that she actually did it. Now, of course, the irony of it is that she doesn't die until the 1880s. So this conspiracy theory of her doing a deathbed confession comes before she's even on her deathbed. But hold on to that thought. So in popular recent culture, um, some of you may be familiar with The Weight of Water. Um, if you want to read it and don't want to know how it ends, you can kind of, I guess, put me on mute for the next minutes because I'm going to tell you how it ends. It's germane to the story. But Anita Shreve, the novelist, writes a novel in 1997, and a movie is made in 2002, which I will say is my movie critic hat on is not a very good movie. Um, but it was, I think it was Karen Bigelow or Kathleen Bigelow. Um, the, she ended up winning an Academy Award for I think, the first female director to win an Academy Award, but this was like her first big movie. But the whole thing with the novel is it takes a spin and basically does say that Marin wrote a confession saying she did it. And that's kind of the linchpin of the story, that the, the, the story kind of goes back and forth between the murders in the 1873 and current day with a photographer and a couple other friends who were basically on a, <clears throat> excuse me, a yacht trip um, around Smutty Nose. It actually was filmed in Nova Scotia. But um, so it's kind of interesting, you know, doing that to a real life person. But, you know, you can make the argument that happens tons of times. Certainly Shakespeare did all that. But she basically, you know, a lot of people, all they know about Smutty Nose is the weight of water. They certainly will have in their mind that, oh, you know, maybe Marin actually did do it. But from all accounts, um, Louis Wagner was the guilty party. So I will quickly go through and, and kind of end the aisles of shows on a little more bucolic picture rather than the murders of Smutty Nose. And um, one of the more interesting stories about the Isles of Shoals is for the last 25 or 30 years, it's been a photographer, Alexandra de Stuger, de Steiger, who is the winter caretaker out there. And she's a photographer, she's a musician, she's a writer. Um, there was a relatively short documentary, and this is a teaser that documentary was done a few years ago that talks about her experiences out on um, Star Island. She was out there this um, this winter. If you follow her on Facebook, she will post. And you know, when you get these nasty storms, I, I didn't see a lot of posts from this week's storm, which I imagine was not too pleasant being out there um, with heavy winds on Star Island. But it's a pretty interesting story. And this is the trailer to the film. There's maybe 15 to 20 wild Canada geese that winter here, and they're able to survive. It's a real lesson because um, there they are, and they're struggling along through every single day and every storm, and and yet each morning they they're so excited to to greet the morning and 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 to be alive. I want to go through life like that. Like a goose. Like a goose, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, 
photography has become such a thing in the world that a lot of photographers think it's all about photography. You just seem like a very uh, calm individual, mm. um, you know, going with whatever comes your way, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, on the island, what, whatever mood strikes you is what, what you go with. It's kind of like the weather, you know, whatever comes along, comes along naturally. What's sacred to me is the sublimity of the natural world and how it makes you feel small and humble and grateful. With the sea and the sky surrounding this island, there is a sense of the vast and, and the mysterious. There's, there's always the far horizon and you know the depths of the ocean sublime. There's something about solitude that quiets my mind and I start to realize what's really important. I just express these essential things with my work. I don't know if there's a purpose in life. What I do know is that, that we are not the purpose of life. That I know. I think life is its, is its own purpose, and whatever that is is a mystery, and I'm okay with not knowing. Yeah, I'm okay with not knowing. So I will say that um, uh, I may like to say I spent a week out there in the winter, um, but I was pretty happy with being there in September. But it's, a, it's an interesting story of her doing that. And she has some phenomenal photographs. And she had an exhibit um, within the last few years at a local gallery. And um, it's really interesting. So that takes us through Star Island. So I want to clean up some of the questions here. Um, I see one about how did Smutty Nose get its name? It, it, nobody really has a great answer for that. It's kind of like if you look at it in profile, one edge of the... Um, island kind of has like a, a suppressed nose of an animal. There's no real great story. Unfortunately, you know, it's got that horrible and incredibly fascinating murder story, um, but this, the name of it is not anywhere near as interesting. And somebody asked a question about the, the railroad on Thatcher Island. That was really just for like small carts, almost like you see like Wiley Coyote doing in you know, a Looney Tunes thing. You know, it wasn't a railroad transporting passengers. I think it's, it's very small, but it was used for transporting materials. And they just had a you know cart carts basically that wheels would run the tracks and they could move this this oil and coal and whatnot throughout the, the different buildings on the island and particularly between the two lighthouses. So we will end our trip uh, on Boone Island. Probably not probably, but definitely the most desolate of our island trips, but the one I am probably most familiar with. So Boone Island. Celia Thaxter has a quote about Boone Island. Boone Island is the forlorn, forlornest place that can be imagined, a slender column against the sky. Sometimes it looms colossal in mirages of summer. In winter, it lies blurred and ghostly at the edge of the chilly sea and pallid sky. So like I said, I spent my summers, or at least a month of my summers, um, in southern Maine on York Beach, along Sands Beach in York. And certainly her quote about Boone Island being a mirage, even Appledore, you can see Appledore from uh, long sands and it would place your eyes in the mirage and the heat would place some really fun, funky tricks. I remember Appledore actually one time we were convinced it was an aircraft carrier, but it wasn't. And Boone Island can seem like it's levitating over the ocean and stuff. So it's pretty neat, very mysterious place. So here it is off the coast. Here we have Cape Medic Light, also known as a nubble right here off of uh, Sohir Park in York. A little bit different view of it going up the coast of Maine. You have Boone Island up here. A whale back is here. The Isles of Shoals will be down kind of over here. And you head up the coast going toward Portland and a bunch of lighthouses up here in, um, in the northern part of Maine on the Sunrise Coast. So this is a double light. Um, if you haven't been there and you live within an hour's radius of where I am, then shame on you. You need to get up there. It's a, it's a cool place. You won't be alone. But you can see Boone Island kind of off to the right here, you can see Boone Island in the distance. And this is Boone Island, seen from the parking lot of the Noble Light. This is an infrared version. They can really kind of sort of see it right here. But it's about eight or nine miles out at sea. 
and with a high powered lens, sometimes in the, this was done, I want to say the fall, the sun will rise right alongside Boone Island and uh, make it look a lot bigger than it is. It's a pretty small, pretty small island, but like I said, it's very dramatic. It's the tallest lighthouse, um, certainly in New England. And kind of like in Gloucester here in York Harbor, York Harbor Beach is just behind here. This is their fisherman memorial and Boone Island is very prevalent there. You have noble light over here, but this is their fisherman memorial. And then here along Long, Long Sands is a marker that kind of explains about Boone Island and some of the stories, which we'll get into, um, one very notorious story. And that was told by the author, Kenneth Roberts, who folks don't really probably familiar with him as much anymore. He was a very, very popular um, historical novelist back in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, Boone Island actually was his last book, which I think was published in 1956. Um, unfortunately, he was also a um, kind of raging anti-immigrant and the Saturday Evening Post back in the 1920s was leading the vanguard of the anti-immigration sentiment in the United States, which got codified in the uh, immigration laws of like 1924 signed by Calvin Coolidge. This kind of plays into a little bit about how he tells the story of Boone Island. Um, he takes the side of the captain, but um, it's not considered one of his best novels. I was fascinated by it because it was a subject on something I would seen off the coast. So when I was in high school, I actually read the book in one day. And uh, it tells the story of the shipwreck uh, in 1710, 1711 of the Nottingham Galley, which is a relatively small ship as far as ships go back in those days, 50 feet long, 12 feet across and it had a captain and 13 crew members, which it's cargo of butter, cheese, and cordage, which is rigging and rope, which becomes important in the story. And it's actually bound for Boston, leaves Ireland uh, on September 24th, which is a bit late for a transatlantic crossing, and then gets kind of hung up in the Atlantic with lack of winds. So it's a month behind schedule. And as a result, as you see in these other shipwrecks, it gets caught up in one of the notorious storms in Meth or in New England that we just had a couple of days ago in a nor'easter, and it wrecks on Boone Island on December 11th, 1710. You know, typically when you're doing these transatlantic crossings, you don't want to be in that area in December, um, and particularly this, this time in history, um, you know, particularly for those of us who grew up in the 60s, uh, that was considered cold. Well, back in the, the late 1600s, early 1700s, I guess it was a mini ice age, and so it was super cold, and this is brutal conditions on this um, collection of rocks off the coast of Maine. And so he's stranded with his crew members and they're wrecked on December 11th. They attempt to make a boat. Um, they said they had this, they were able to scavenge some stuff from the wreck, cheese actually, they get little balls of cheese and they had this cordage, which they use to kind of make um, insulated um, socks, footwear. I mean, they have nothing. And you know they, they're stranded on this, they're wet. They have no fire, they have no shelter. And they're stuck on this, you know, nub of land um, in December of 1710. They subsist on seaweed and mussels. And according to different accounts, they do get a seal at one point. Um, they attempt a raft. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, seamen and a, a guy only known as the Swede, they basically build a raft. After the first one gets swamped, they try again with they can salvage some cord or some wood and they can salvage some was rigging to try and you know, construct something. I think they actually like lash their hands um, to the wood so they won't um, they won't move, and they try and go to launch themselves to shore because they can see smoke. I mean, it's only you know nine or ten miles off the coast. You can see it. You can see land. Um, certainly on a clear day, it's not you know out of the question to see land relatively consistently, particularly when you get these crystal clear days that you can see in December in New England. <clears throat> and unfortunately, they try this last dish. At attempt and it kind of succeeds sort of because one um, wash is frozen on the beach and wells and that's a signal to the people uh, on land that there's something going on like where did this guy come from and the only reasonable explanation there, there are no other islands really off the, the coast here so the only explanation really is the fact that there's must be somebody out on Boone Island so the ship's carpenter ends up passing away and the captain, John Dean, in a previous life, he was a butcher. So some of his crew says, why don't you do what you used to do? And they do end up eating this guy. And uh, ironically, 
this is after the guy has washed ashore. So the people at uh, on the mainland are actually trying to get a rescue party, but the weather's not that great. So they can't get out there because the weather is stopping them from doing it. So they make the decision to, you know, plunge into this cannibalism, which will forever stain them, obviously. And then, you know, and also makes the story will be told forever. You know, if you have cannibalism in your story, you're going to go down in history, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you want to be remembered in history, they'll get it for you, but for a bad thing. And so you have throughout history, the, you know, the alive thing in the Andes, and you have the ship, uh, whaling ship, the Essex, you know, all these cannibal stories are kind of fascinating and repulsive. So it gets told. And this whole story, the accounts that are told by various parties, mostly the, the captain and the first mate, are very contradictory. And they end up, we'll get to this in a second, they end up kind of playing out in, in the press as it was in the 1700s London. And so the first mate claims he holds out to the next day. He and his, his, his crew don't want to do it, but they are so hungry that eventually they do succumb to um, eating part of the carpenter the next day. But unbeknownst to them, the first rescue boat is actually on its way. And so it comes out just a couple of days later on January 2nd. Um, I don't believe they actually take anybody off the island at that point, um, but they, you know, they've been, I think somebody comes on because it, once again, you see there's really nowhere to land on this place just a bunch of rocks, a lot of submerged reefs around here is very, very difficult. So obviously people who are coming out to rescue, they're concerned they don't want to end up like these guys. Um, so they are able to get them some stuff I think they're able to get them fire, able to get them some sort of canvas so they can have, you know, a little bit of shelter. And then they go back and they come back um, two, two days later on January 4th and they rescue the remaining crew. And 10 of the original 14 survive. So they're brought into Portsmouth, um, they're nursed back to health. A lot of digits are lost, a lot of frostbite, um, but 10 of the 14 do survive. And it becomes the most infamous maritime event as far as like English maritime history is concerned. This is a big deal. And this story becomes really the biggest maritime story up until the HMS Bounty happens about 70 years later. Um, with Fletcher Christians, Christians and uh, William Bly. But this is, you know, quite a story. It's, it's, it's pretty, you know, I mean, not a lot of people know about it. Um, certainly Kenneth Roberts' books brought it to the forefront there about 60, 70 years ago, but it is a relatively untold story at this point in the game. But in its day, it was incredibly notorious. So what you have is the captain and his brother are actually on the boat. And the first mate, Christopher Langman and his crew, and they, they get themselves back to England. And they're basically, because there's, you know, cannibalism involved, everybody's trying to spin the story and, you know, obviously come out to their best advantage. And there are, are implications and um, accusations from the first uh, mate that basically uh, Dean and his brother were trying to scuttle the boat to get the insurance. There's uh, accusations that they had overinsured it. And even before the, the, the um, voyage got full underway, they tried to sell it to a French privateer because at those, at that point, the French and the English were at war, which they kind of constantly were for a couple hundred years. Um, so they're both literate. Um, and there are all these broadsheets um, within the, the um, pub community within London. And there are these um, narratives. And so typically, and, and um, uh, Kenneth Roberts takes John Dean's side. And if you read the book, it's, it's over the top how much like John Dean is just kind of like, you know, a heroic figure. And this guy is just trying to undermine him at every single way. Every single thing that John Dean does, uh, Christopher Langham is trying to undercut him. So that's why the book is, it's very black and white. That's it's not, not a lot of nuance. The story is, is interesting, but he really kind of goes over the top. And so um, a gentleman wrote a book um, not that long ago, less than 10 years ago, and he kind of looks at it through a different lens. And once again, you're trying to piece something together from 300 years ago, but he comes up with that this guy's story actually may have been more true than John Dean, because ironically, John Dean really can't get a job in the English Navy. So he ends up going to Russia of all places and works in the Russian Navy for like 20 or 30 years, which can kind of be an implicit, um, you know, judgment on how the, um, the powers that be in the English Navy felt about him. But that's a really complicated story, obviously 300 years in the, in the past, we can't agree on stuff that happened two years ago. Um, so it's unclear exactly, you know, kind of how it all unfolded, but there's no doubt that there was cannibalism, um, but there's also no doubt they survived basically three weeks in incredibly, incredibly brutal conditions on a nub of land. Because Boone Island is, it's only 14 feet above sea level. So they were constantly getting washed, you know, the waves that come up and they were getting sprayed by the water. So once again, they don't have any kind of shelter and they're getting wet, which is a bad combination for 
yourself in December, no matter what time, uh, no matter what year it is. But the tower is 133 feet tall, the tallest in New England. So it's about 10 feet taller than Thatcher Island. Um, 1799 is when the beacon was first lit and the current tower was built in 1855. Um, basically, for those of you from around here, remember the blizzard of 78, that kind of washed everything away except for the tower on Boone Island. And that was really the kind of last straw for the Coast Guard. And they're saying, we're going to automate this thing. So basically in 1980, they automated it because up, up to that point, now, Boone Island was pretty remote. And the, the keepers, there were no families there, it was just keepers. And they were rotated on and off the island, two weeks on and then one week ashore. Uh, very similar if you're familiar with the offshore drilling that happens down the Gulf of Mexico and how people staff those things. <clears throat> very similar type of thing that happened in Boone Island. So Boone Island was a pretty rough place and um, automation has been a good thing for that. And it had a Fresnel lens, second order Fresnel lens. It's further out in the ocean. It doesn't need to have the power that the first order had at that Thatcher Island. But as I mentioned before, there's this neat little um, museum down in Kittery called the Kittery Historical and Naval Museum. It had the Celia Thaxter artifacts that I showed you earlier. It also has the Fresnel lens from Boone Island. As soon as you're walking the door, it's right here. There's a quilt of Boone Island and some other artifacts of Boone Island, but it's, it's a really neat little museum that I didn't know existed until about six months or a year ago, um, right south of the outlets in Kittery. So the final trip is how do you get out to Boone Island? Because I've been looking at Boone Island from the shore for over 50 years and, and it's become kind of a, a, a mythical thing for our family is like, how do you get out to Boone Island rather than like renting a boat or something? Well, there is a place called the Echo Adventures out of Kennebunkport, Maine, which runs a boat pretty much during the summer. I think it's every, at least once a day out of Kennebunkport down to the Noble Lighthouse and then you uh, bang a turn and go out to Boone Island. And the boat is, it's a little bit, this is an older version of it, but it's not that much different. The unique part is you straddle this seat and these boats go very fast. It goes out, tops out like 40 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour, um, so which is kind of a thrill ride. Um, and it's not cheap. It's like $99 to go out there. But um, for, your, for you, dear viewers, my wife and I <laughs> went and did this last September. I've always wanted to go to Boone Island and this was an excuse to do it. So. We did it. And my wife, Lisa, who's on the call, she put together a little video of kind of sort of what it's like to blast out to Boone Island. that puts you out to Boone Island. Um, it is, get these pictures here. Um, you know, it is a speck of rocks out there. Uh, somebody does own it privately. It was purchased a couple of years ago. It was, it was, it was, sold, it was on sale for like $89,000. Somebody bought it for $120,000. So really, you have to get a Zodiac boat to kind of get up there. There's not really an easy way to get there. And it does have the foghorn, which, you know, it's run by the Coast Guard. So there are certain navigational things that have to run. Um, I believe the guy who bought it actually has bought some other lighthouses. It may have bought either Graves Light or Minot's Light, which is off the coast uh, south of Boston. But uh, I don't think it's a great candidate for an Airbnb. <laughs> um, but going out there in the boat, it was kind of cool. Um, you know, we did donuts in the water before we went out there. <laughs> um, and I said I had uh, my hand on the hat the whole time we went out there. It was, it was a beautiful day and it was a unique experience and uh, it was a lot of fun. And there's also tons of seals. So right off the, the ledges on Boone Island, there were just tons of seals basking in the water and looking at us and they have such a human face on them and you know, almost like a dog, they look at you and kind of like, what is that? Um, so it's kind of neat, but it is, um, you know, it's definitely a harsh place. And um, I will end up by giving a little bit of a shout out to a gentleman who was kind of a benefactor for lighthouse keepers for, for decades, Edward Rose Snow. Um, he was the, the flying Santa and he used to drop off gifts, bags of gifts to lighthouse keepers and their families during the Christmas season. And he also has written, I think he wrote over 40 books on various topics on lighthouses and shipwrecks. So he was a source for um, a couple of his books I used as sources for this. I did get a chance to see him speak when I was very, very young. Um, up in uh, York Village in Maine in the summer, but um, 
for those of us of a certain age, Edward Rose Snow was a big deal. He was an adventurer, a Renaissance man. There's, there's videos of him jumping off of, I think, Minot's Light into the water. Um, but he was a, a huge proponent of the lighthouse um, keepers and, and keeping up their, um, their stories uh, of the lighthouses and of the maritime history of the Boston Harbor Islands and New England shipwrecks in general. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, lots of kind of backstory I used to put this together. Um, pretty much everything's available through the Merrimack Valley Library Consortium. So um, thank you so much to them. And every week when I show up at Chelmsford Library for my weekly stash of, of information, it's uh, amazing what you can get through these networks. Um, if you want to follow me, I'm on Instagram at bmagphoto. I have a website at bmagnuson.smugmug.com. And I'm on Facebook at uh, Bruce J. Magnuson Photography. Uh, I do have an entry in the Griffin 29th Annual Juried Members Exhibition. It'll be going up in uh, mid to late April. I just found out yesterday that one of my images was chosen for that. So I'm very happy and proud about that and honored to be there with a bunch of other 59 other photographic artists. And um, the next talk I'm working on, which is to be scheduled probably sometime in the later spring, my daughter is over in Athens, Greece on a Fulbright Fellowship for 10 months. So my wife and I have had the Pleasure of going over there once in November, and we're going back in a couple of weeks. And uh, Greece is a fascinating place, and uh, something I knew very little about as far as their more recent history. So um, I put together a presentation that deals with um, a little bit of the ancient history. Obviously, you can't get away from that in, in Greece, but to me, it's actually more interesting into the current history, and it's it's very complicated and uh, and very fascinating. And we ended up getting exposed to some of it in a very real way on November seventeenth last year. So with that. A couple of minutes for any more questions. Um, oh, somebody went out to the Harbor Islands with Edward Rose Snow. Yeah, he used to give the narrated tours. That was before my time in Boston. I would have loved to have listened to it. All right. If there are not any other questions or comments, I thank you so much for your time. Glad you could spend a Thursday night. And um, look forward to seeing you at a future talk. Thank you so much.